Hey guys, Pete here. This is going to be part two of Are the Gods Real in a Game of Thrones? And if you haven't seen part one, I'll put a link right here at the top. You should watch that first. Of course, at the end of that one, I'll put a link to this one so you can watch them in order. No real spoilers here. This is just theory based on stuff we know from the books. But if you haven't watched Game of Thrones through season six, you probably want to finish that up before you watch these videos. So in part one, we talked about R'hllor, the Lord of Light, who seems to be the most credible of all the supernatural deities that we know from the show. We looked at many of the different things that Melisandre has done in order to figure out if they are related to magic and is that magic unrelated to a supernatural deity like the Lord of Light. My conclusion is that the magic is real, but the religions are created as a way to kind of explain this mysterious force of nature that is magic. So the big stumbling block in the theory of everything just being magic is these visions in the flames. And I said that I'd go over some of the theories related to what that might be if the Lord of Light isn't actually communicating with Melisandre and the other red priests and priestesses. If you only watch the show, you're going to have to take my word for some of the characters and events that come from the books that I'm going to use to explain this. When I was actually researching this, I found a pretty good succinct theory on Reddit, which I'm going to use and I'm, I can link to that in the description. It's submitted by the user Fagon the Conqueror. It's a couple years old and it's pretty in line with what I've been thinking about this for a while after reading through the books more than once. Honestly, after the first read, I was pretty confused about R'hllor because it did seem kind of credible and that affected other readings. And I think that this is the same place where the, the Redditor is coming from. So like I said, if you're not a book reader, the first thing you have to know about are glass candles. We haven't seen any glass candles in the show and I don't believe that we will because none of this is going to be essential as far as telling the end of the story as far as the show's storyline goes. But basically glass candles come from Valyria and they were a tool that the sorcerers used to see long distances. They could also enter a man's dreams and give them visions. And they were able to speak to one another half a world apart seated before their candles. The power of these candles is attributed to magic as the, the people in the freehold really weren't religious. They, they practiced a sort of religious tolerance for the people who lived there because they knew that was good for controlling the population. But beyond that, they're not before before Aegon came to conquer Westeros, they didn't really line themselves up with actual religions. I mean, there are gods in their, you know, in their mythology and things like that, but they're just not religious people. So to look at the, the glass candles again, they're basically communication devices and there's quite a few of them out there in the world. We know the Citadel has four of them that are about a thousand years or more old and it's not a hundred percent clear exactly how they work. Like, it, you know, to communicate between two people, do both people have to have a candle? Obviously they can give people visions and they can enter people's dreams with just one. And they can see things similar to what we know about what the green seers do in the weirwood trees. So we've heard about glass candles a couple times. The first introduction is in the second book, A Clash of Kings, when Zaro tells Daenerys that the glass candles are burning in the house of Eurathon Nightwalker and that they haven't burned in a hundred years. Later we get a much detailed description because Samwell actually sees one when he goes to the Citadel. When he gets there, he sort of gets taken off of his normal path by one of my favorite characters, Archmaester Marwyn the Mage, who is not your typical Archmaester. But he has a candle, Sam sees it, and the candle itself is like three foot tall with the, and it's very slender. It's ridged and twisted and it's glittering black and Sam immediately notices that it's made out of obsidian or dragon glass once he puts his eyes on it. We find out that these guys have known that Sam was coming because they saw his arrival in the glass candle. So we could guess that maybe people knew that Daenerys was going to Karth in the same way. Now, remember the first mention, they say that they hadn't burned in a hundred years. This is almost a hundred percent related to the birth of the dragons. 
But what's confusing is that are dragons being hatched now because magic came back? Or is magic coming back because the dragons were hatched? We really don't know which, which one is the cause and which one's the effect. What we do know, though, is that magic is on the rise, magical things are happening, and all of a sudden these communication devices where you can go into a person's dreams and control them and give them visions have started to burn again. So this is the part where if you are a believer in R'hllor, you think this whole idea of glass candles, that's really too far-fetched. Like, really? But it's not in the context of the story because we've seen a character who does exactly this through the Weirwood Trees. Brendan Rivers contacted Bran in his dreams and set things in motion for a small crippled boy to travel from his home all the way north beyond the wall, which is pretty remarkable and would be hard to believe if we hadn't actually seen it happen. As someone who comes from a skeptical point of view, this is basically enough to make me think that it's possible that the visions that Melisandre sees in particular are somehow being manipulated by men. I get that if you aren't from that same point of view, though, that this would be a harder stretch to make. From there, we just sort of have to ask ourselves, what's the story about? Is it about a classic struggle between good, a good force and an evil force? Or is George R.R. R. Martin trying to point out more about, you know, the struggle for power, the absurdity of feudalism, and so on and so forth? There's definitely a debate there, but this is not the video for that debate. So my thoughts to this point haven't really changed. I feel like the religions in A Game of Thrones, the gods are constructs. But it wouldn't be right to just look at my point of view. So in part three, I'll go through one really good explanation of R'hllor being real. And then we'll all look at which side we land on. Now, before I go, I do want to point out that there are a lot of question marks and the idea that I'm laying out with the glass candles could be involved in the visions isn't that it explains everything. Like, we really don't know how long that Melisandre's been having visions or the other Red Priests have. It's never explicitly said. And we know Melisandre's been alive for a long time, so she could have had visions in the past before the magic started to kind of disappear. But that gets into some really complicated speculation, and the fact is we just don't know. All we know is that she thinks she's really good at it, and that at least during our story, she's seen some things that have been very hard to ignore. Like, she definitely sees things that come from a magical source. What I find Melisandre so interesting is, is that we know for sure that she also, in her fanatical kind of devotion to the Lord of Light, uses any trick necessary to try to convert people to her way of thinking. And what stands out in the reading that we don't really get in the show is that everything she's done while she was misled into thinking that Stannis was Azor High Reborn led up to her being at the wall. In the books, we find out that she is much stronger at the wall. In A Dance with Dragons, she says that she's even stronger there than she was in A Shy. And as far as blood magic and her shadow binding, we would think that she would be the strongest in a shy. But for some reason, when she's at the wall, she starts to come into her own and realize she doesn't need these tricks that she uses from, you know, the potions and other things. And then there's resurrection and not just her resurrecting John, as we've seen in the TV show. Because we haven't got a good description of how that works in the book yet. But we also have Thoros of Mir who brings back Beric Dondarrion several times. So that's all stuff we'll cover in part three. I hope you'll let me know what you think in the comments. Please like the video. Don't forget the book giveaway is still going on. When I reach 28,000 subscribers, I'll pick someone who does a comment on this video or any of the related ones and I'll send them a copy of the 20th anniversary of A Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin. It's the illustrated copy and it's really awesome. There'll be a link in the description for you to check it out. And all you have to do is be a subscriber and leave a comment. So get with it, get your chance to win, tell your friends about it, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. I have some new stuff coming out and thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.